Hello, I'm Lugog TV, and with yet another expansion to the Player Owned Ports just released, I'm here to bring you a tutorial on just that, the Player Owned Ports. Now, before we begin, Ports is a large piece of content, so this video will be rather long. Please refer to this index or the description box below this video for when and where items are discussed. There's going to be a lot, so let's get right to it. Player-owned ports is a management-based activity in which you send ships on voyages to the eastern lands. By doing this, you receive trade goods from successful voyages with which you can upgrade your port and ships, recruit new crew and captains, and also where you can craft items to aid your adventures, or craft some of the highest level and most coveted gear in Gilinor, Tetsu, Death Lotus, and Sea Singer. The player-owned ports can be found on the north side of Port Serem, just beside the Rusty Anchor Inn, and does not have any stat or quest requirements to enter the activity. However, to progress in the activity, you must have level 90 or above in at least one of the following. Fishing, Slayer, Runecrafting, Herb Lore, Prayer, Thieving, Cooking, Construction, Agility, Divination, or Dungeoneering. Some of the quickest ways to get to the player-owned ports are the Cabbage Ring, then running south to the player-owned ports portal, the Port Serum Lodestone, then running northeast to the portal, a Clan Vexillium, then running southeast, or a Spear Tree, if you have one planted nearby, and simply running a little west. After receiving the Captain's Log item from ports, you can simply right-click it to show the option to teleport, which will teleport you directly outside the portal. The activity is based upon sending ships on voyages with a fixed success rate. That success rate is the sole factor on whether your ship will return with riches or ruin. Ports is also a tier-based activity, in the sense that you progressively unlock new regions, which in turn come bundled with higher voyage requirements, longer voyage durations, and more available resources. But, if the voyages are dependent on some fixed rate, how do we make sure our ships guarantee a safe return, or at least a probably safe return? Very shortly we'll discuss what the success rate is based on, then discuss how to up those rates. Before we discuss anything further, we must first analyze the port interface. Upon entering the port, a ship's tab will appear wherever you have designated the minigame tab to be, and you should notice a new interface piece on the uppermost center part of your screen. That interface houses six buttons and two expandable and collapsible windows. The six buttons, which will become your best friends for ports when you become familiar with them, in order from top left to bottom right, are Voyages, which is where you can go to send your ships on their maiden voyage and go further as to customize a ship's crew and parts, and also where you would go to apply ship buffs to a ship. More on this is covered later, when we discuss voyages. The crew roster, which is where you can go to recruit and dismiss crewmates and captains. Again, more on this when we discuss this item later on. The shipyard, which is where you can go to customize, upgrade, and ultimately send out your ship. Through the interface that opens, you can also access the voyage list from the bottom left of the screen. Upgrade buildings, which is where you would go to, as the name suggests, upgrade your port buildings using resources gained from playing the activity. The ports management, which is where you would go to choose the region you'd like your ships to sail to when you have multiple regions unlocked, as well as where you'd go to designate which scroll recipe you would like to hunt for. Keep the latter part regarding scrolls in mind for later discussion. And lastly, the archi... the archipelag... the archipelag... The map, which is where you would go to observe how far into the current region you are, which directly relates to how far away you are from the next region. You can mouse over the different islands for funny and interesting factoids about that island. As for the two expandable windows, you have the resources window, which shows you, also as the name suggests, the different resources and trade goods, and how many of each you have. And the visitors window, which shows you the different adventurers with available voyages, as well as what Felix the Black Marketeer currently has for sale. These will be discussed more in depth within this video. Upon opening your voyage list, you may notice that any given voyage has, under adversity, a bar with a number beside either morale, combat, seafaring, or any combination between them. Generally, the more factors the voyage requires, the lower the requirement for those factors will be. Likewise, if the voyage requires only one factor, that factor will require more investment in it. The overall success of the mission is based off of the lowest factors percentile. For example, if the voyage in question requires three factors, of which you can provide 75% in morale and 72% in seafaring, but only 69% in combat, that voyage would have a 69% success rate. But how do we increase these factors? 
This can be done by leveling up or replacing your crew, upgrading your ship, and or activating one-time buffs to your voyage. Your crew, along with your ship, are the two biggest factors towards the success rate of any given voyage. You purchase crew members with gold accumulated at the port, known as chimes, as well as with resources acquired at the tier they are unlocked at. Various crew members also have specific and sometimes unique traits and abilities, which can either aid or hinder your chances at success. Crew members specialize in one voyage factor, and as such, you will find yourself purchasing numerous crew members specializing in the different factors. There are also unique crew members who offer sometimes unique abilities, of which there are three kinds. Merchants, who contribute to morale, I'll bet lower than usual morale specialized sailors, However, they make up for their lack of morale by improving how many goods you receive from a given voyage. Balanced crewmates, who contribute to every factor at a lower than usual rate, but their contributions is collectively more beneficial than specialized crewmates in various situations. And lastly, joint crewmates, who contribute in two voyage factors, contributing greater in one than the other, and also offer an ability that is sometimes unique to them specifically. Some unique crew members need to be unlocked, however. More on that when we discuss voyages. You level up your crewmates by sending them on voyages. Leveling up your crewmates ups how much they contribute to their voyage factors. All crew members can level up to a max of level 10. You can also read more into this topic by clicking the link regarding this in this video's description box. Your ship, being the other major factor towards the success of your voyages, is just as vital to the success of your voyage as is your crew. Your ship consists of five parts the rudder, the hull, the ram or figurehead, and deck items 1 and 2. These parts can be upgraded to offer better contribution to the various voyage factors and mixed and matched to account for the different voyage needs. Much like your crew, your various ship parts can specialize in the various voyage factors, allowing you to better customize your ship for the specific voyage requirements. Covering the various ship parts very quickly, we have the rudder, which solely focuses on the speed factor, and is your ship's primary, if not only, investment for speed. The hull, which contributes to every primary voyage factors, morale, combat, and seafaring, while contributing heavily to one factor specifically. The deck items, which can focus on any of the three primary voyage factors of your choosing, and the ram, aka the figurehead, which primarily focuses on morale and combat at the lower tiers. It is suggested to invest in crew members before purchasing ship parts, however, that is up to personal preference. You can also hide outdated ship parts from previous tiers by checking the small box in the bottom right of the screen. I highly suggest it. Ship buffs, which are very simply one-time use items which offer various benefits. Ship buffs are collected by completing the different in-port minigames, which will be covered later in this video. The different ship buffs are your basics, Bag of Winds, which offers a plus 10% speed boost to a specific ship, Ration Packs, which offers a plus 10% morale boost to a specific ship, Powder Kegs, which offers a plus 10% combat boost to a specific ship, and Sea Singer's Bottle Cry, which offers a plus 10% seafaring boost to a specific ship. And the more advanced buffs, which are your lifeboat, which saves your crew members if your boat fails drastically, Lowe's Tint Spectacles, which offers a plus 50% experience boost to the crewmates participating in the same voyage as the ship it was used on, and the Fortune of the Sea, which offers a plus 10% rewards and penalty boost to a specific ship. So if a ship would get 100 resources from one voyage, it would then get 110. 10% of 100 being 10. Huh. <laughs> Math, right? However, it also increases any penalty your ship might encounter. It is generally well worth the risk. You can also receive various port rerolls, which, as the name suggests, allows you to reroll various selectables, bringing up a fresh selection for you of their respective fields, these fields being crew, captain, voyages, and adventurers. All ship buffs have a limit to how many you can store at any given moment, and ship buffs received after that capacity has been reached will be discarded, rendering them useless and obtaining them pointless. So, be mindful of that. So. We have finally finished purchasing our crew and upgrading our ships, and now we are ready to disembark. But, wait, where are we headed? After opening your list of available voyages, you'll immediately notice that there are three voyages to choose from, of which you can re-roll any individual voyage if you so desire, up to how many voyage re-rolls you have available. Voyage re-rolls reset daily. 
All voyages have a level of adversity, which can range from 500 to 2,000 adversity in the lowest region, the Ark, while the highest region, the Shield, can reach upwards to 4,000 adversity in a single factor voyage. You must decide whether you can overcome the adversity or conform to it. Regardless of your decision, you should aim to make the success rate as high as possible, as discussed before. After doing that, you can send your ship on its way, and when it returns, you will either receive its riches or hear of its ruins. There are unique voyages from nearly every region which allows you to unlock various aspects within the player-owned ports. Whether it's new crew members or whatnot, these unique voyages have higher adversity levels and as such may prove to be more difficult, usually requiring you to ship off voyages with sometimes even a 60% chance of success. Failing a voyage can result in one of four things, dependent on how badly the voyage went. The four ways are nothing, which is the preferred failure, your ship gets damaged, which simply requires you to pay for the repairs with port resources, your ship gets docked, which simply means you can't send the ship on a voyage for an hour, or loss of crewmates, which is where your crewmates would have died during the voyage, so you could lose multiple sailors and would have to replace them. You should always aim for as high of a success rate as you can. However, it is up to you how low of a success rate you are willing to risk. Also note, every Thursday you can enter the bar in the northwest corner of ports and speak to or right-click Cerula the Barmaid for a bit of gossip which will result in a voyage that will override your bottommost voyage, but offer a large amount of port resources in relation to their adversity level. You hopefully notice that your voyages have a duration to them, which dictates how long the voyage is until it's completed. The speed stat, available through crewmates specialized in speed, your ship's rudders, and the bags of wind ship buff can all contribute to shortening the duration. However, any voyage can be shortened by so much, and the ship's rudders usually offer enough speed to lower it to its minimum. Point trying to be made, speed investment, aside from your ship's rudders, no worth it. Throughout the player-owned ports, there are numerous unique NPCs with their own stories, in which they will require your services and offer loads of rewards in return. To encounter specific NPCs, you must have level 90 plus in their respective skill, of which there are a total of 11 of these unique NPCs, also known as adventurers. Every day you will be able to interact with at least one of the adventurers you have unlocked, and they can offer one of two kinds of missions. Story missions, in which their personal stories progress and you will get to hear their backstory and witness their plans unfold. The last mission in their storyline offers a massive resource reward, so progressing with their story is highly beneficial. And resource missions, which don't progress their story any, but can offer you port resources, experience with upwards of 35,000 experience in their respective skills in the highest regions, scrolls, which we'll cover shortly, as well as trade goods. The trade goods, specifically, are also adventurer dependent, as specific adventurers will only offer specific trade goods. These voyages can, by far, be the most difficult voyages in regards to adversity levels, so make sure you use your best crew and ship parts to tackle these, or you may end up wasting your time and or resources. There are also various buildings and ports that you can upgrade to provide an array of benefits, as there are quite a few, each with little nitpicky details. To save time, I'll be skipping over those details and leaving you with this. Make sure to upgrade the office ASAP, as it unlocks you another ship for you to use as you please. You can have up to four ships, and you can use the same ship part on all of them, while crew members can only be used on one at a time. Totem and Icon Hotspots are beneficial to invest in, as they offer increased rates to receive various beneficial benefits. The other buildings, while all very nice to have, aren't as demanding to be purchased immediately as the previous mentioned. However, you can't purchase the Totem Hotspots until at earliest the fourth region. If you have the resources, make sure to upgrade your buildings, especially the passive buff buildings that directly aid your ship, like the Shipwright and Warehouse. If you recall discussing the various ship buffs, this is how you obtain them. Throughout ports, you can participate in numerous minigames, which may be made available to you whenever you finish a voyage, kind of like the pits in Agility. The current minigames being A Simple Favor, which is a minigame revolving around you playing as the Black Marketeer Felix, where you have to locate the five various Death Lotus Ninja hidden away in barrels scattered around the port and help them assassinate a designated target. 
The ninja will give you a small description of who they want you to assassinate, and each time you fail to click the right person, they will criticize you and provide another piece of information regarding the target. Generally, after receiving the first description of the target, you can go around quickly clicking all the NPCs wandering the lower part of the port who match the description, as you're bound to quickly find them. And if you're having trouble locating the ninja, a highlight arrow will appear directing you to where one is hidden after a short time. Last Orders, in which you play as Cerula the Barmaid and deliver 20 beers to the various clients in and around her bar in under 10 minutes. Cerula can only hold two beers at one time and must return to her counter to refill after providing at most two clients a drink. Even while being a seemingly straightforward objective, that quickly can go haywire if you overlook a client and proceed to the next area, as it will confuse you as you search for them where you have already been. I would suggest starting with all the clients in the bar, then the clients outside the bar, finishing with the clients on the second floor of the bar upstairs. Having a system of sorts reduces the likelihood of accidentally overlooking a client, and if you do, you can quickly retrace your steps to locate them. Even though 10 minutes is allotted, you'll come to find you'll only be using about 3 of them. Helping Hand, being a minigame in which you play as Umi, the sea singer, as she tries to locate 2-3 to three tools hidden in the barrels lying around the room. After receiving a description of the required tools from the warehouse worker, you must click on the various barrels trying to find the tool which matches the description. Try your hardest to memorize where the various tools are in the barrels, that way you can quickly retrieve them after receiving the second order. Doing this can result in this minigame being completed very quickly in comparison to the others. And Meg. Wrong Meg. Still wrong. Correct. Meg, while not really qualifying as a minigame and doesn't give you ship buffs, allows you to send her out on her adventure once a week, resetting Wednesdays. Meg is a budding adventurer who looks to you and your expertise to assist her in her endeavors. She will ask you three questions regarding different scenarios, and after you answer her, she will set out. Dependent on your answers, when she returns, she will give you a chest, which will have gold pieces and an experience limb within it. The experience lamps can be any of the four treasure hunter lamps, ranging from small, medium, large, and huge. And finally, we get to discuss rewards. The trade goods you receive from special and sometimes regular voyages are put into place now. The chi globes, plates, and lacquer goods can be made into their respective armors, which require upwards of level 90 runecrafting, smithing, or crafting respectively. Lots of respect being tossed around. Ancient bones being able to be fletched into various scrimshaws that can offer benefits in a variety of ways, as well as death lotus darts, of which the scrimshaws require upwards of 95 fletching, with the darts 92 fletching. The spices, pearls, and koi scales being used for rock tail soup, the leviathan ring, and the reef walker's cape, again, respectively. Each of these rewards, save for the rock tail soup, have regular and superior variants, the regular being weaker but tradable, so it is possible to make profit through the use of ports. As of January 2015, a regular Tetsu plate body sells for 5.6 million GP. The regular variant also degrades to dust, while their superior counterparts are not tradable, but are also repairable while not degrading to dust. Regular variants also require less resources to make, again, taking the Pletsu tape plate body as an example. Regular Tetsu plate body requiring 80 plate, while the superior Tetsu plate body requires 100 plate. You also unlock titles progressing through ports, where there are 7 titles in total, ending with Admiral. However, just to make matters more complicated, before you can make any of the rewards, you must receive four scrolls from the special voyages, as mentioned previously. If you open your port management window, you will get to choose a scroll you'd like to search for. So, if you'd like Tetsu before unlocking the ability to make scrimsaws, just select a Tetsu piece, complete four of the scroll missions, switch to the next piece, another four scroll missions, and repeat for every item you want unlocked. Then, work towards gaining the required trade goods, then make the item. Simple, right? Yeah. Oh, and note that Felix the Black Marketeer, whom you may remember from the Last Orders minigame, sells port resources for chimes, so if you're ever just short of a purchase, look to see if Felix is selling what you need. I personally never use Felix, aside from his minigame. Personal. This tutorial was made just days after the second player-owned ports expansion was released, and as such, doesn't house all the intricacies that may have come with it. 
Instead, it is my hope that you can watch this video and learn enough that you may understand and experience the expansion for yourself, and just because the name of the item changed doesn't mean the process to unlock and obtain it did. Now, go forth and use what you hopefully learned here and apply it to your player-owned ports career. So thank you for sticking around to the end of this video. I wish you the best of luck in all your RuneScape and real-life endeavors. Take care, and God bless.